James Nachtway is one of the greatest photographers of our time. For almost four decades, he has been documenting poverty, famine, disease and conflicts. He decided to become a war photographer after watching the images from Vietnam taken by reporters such as Don McCullin. He presents himself as an anti-war photographer and still believes in the power of images to prevent conflict. He is the recipient of the Princess of Asturias Award for Communication and Humanities. I use the Mark III. Why do you do this job, especially the, the war part? Uh, you know that the British uh, photographer Don McCallum says that uh, you can only be uh, a war photographer in the long term if you have a purpose. Which is your purpose? Yeah. Because people have to know what's going on in the world. And when there's a war, there's so much at stake for the people involved in the war and for the rest of the world. Photographs can get behind the political rhetoric that is always surrounding a war that creates a, a kind of uh, justification for the people who are conducting the war. And photographers are on the ground they're seeing what's happening to individual human beings and uh, showing the effect of the war and they're holding accountable the decision makers and policy makers who are conducting the war. And this is, uh, this is a way in which public opinion can be brought to bear to pressure um, change. Do you think that uh, a picture can be an antidote uh, to war? Yes, I think that in a way, uh, a picture that shows the true face of war is an anti-war photograph. Uh, it, it, it would, in my experience in seeing what war does to people and societies, it would be very difficult to um, promote that. And uh, so I think uh, that, that photographs that show the true face of war in a way are mediating against using war as a means of, of, uh, of conducting policy. I think there are things worth fighting for in this life. Mm. And I think the people have to defend themselves. Um, but I think we should also be aware where war leads, what are the inevitable consequences of war in human terms. Mm -hmm. And we must never forget it, and we must think deeply upon it before ever committing people to fight a war. You have covered uh, dozens uh, of wars. Uh, is there uh, particularly one that has marked you more than the others? When someone is suffering, when someone has been victimized, uh, it's hard to say one is more important than sure. the other. I think they're all sure equally important. Having said that, the genocide in Rwanda was something that was so extreme and so unusual. Uh, it was very hard to actually understand in my mind how it, it could be that 800,000 to a million people were slaughtered by their countrymen in three months using farm implements as weapons. What, what, there's a moment that comes when, a, when, when someone is raising a, a, a machete or an ax above the head of an innocent person. What allows them to bring that weapon down upon that, their neighbor? I, I actually can't understand that. Most of, uh, of your work is done in black and white. But, I mean, if, if your purpose is to portray reality, in fact, reality is not shaped in, in black and white. That's it's right. shaped in, in color. Yeah. So why the black and white? That's right. Black and white is not real. And it's, it's abstract. But what it does do is that it, it, I think it distills the essence of what's actually happening because color itself is such a strong phenomenon uh, in a physical sense that, uh, mm. that, it's, that it, in a way it competes with what is happening in the picture and it tries to become the subject of the picture. 
So to abstract it into black and white distills the essence of what's happening without competing with color. What makes the difference between a good image and an iconic image? I mean, what are uh, iconic images made of? I think there has to be some very strong, genuine, deeply human emotion expressed in the picture. Uh, it has to be uh, a situation which is historically significant. And, you know, the journalism 101, you have to be in the right place at the right time, which sounds kind of simple, but actually it's extremely it's difficult, as, as you know. <laughs> And I, th I think it has to be the condition of public awareness of a certain event has to reach a certain point before a picture can become iconic. For example, the picture of, of the young boy, Alan Kurdi, who was uh, drowned off the coast of Turkey. Mm -hmm. It came at a moment mm -hmm. when the world was aware enough of that mm -hmm. situation mm -hmm. where it galvanized public opinion. The picture of uh, Nick Ut. Of the, of the young girl who was, you know, running from the napalm. Mm -hmm. uh, in Vietnam. In the Vietnam War. Mm -hmm. It happened at a time when uh, there was, you know, enough awareness of the war and of enough course. protest against the war mm -hmm. that that picture, again, galvanized public mm -hmm. opinion. Speaking about that, hard impact images and mass media. Do you know, uh, surely, firsthand that publishers and editors are quite often reluctant to publish these kind of images. You mentioned the island, Kurdi. Example is a very good one. And the most used argument is that uh, by publishing these images, we are some kind undermining the dignity of the victims. Does it make any sense to you? People suffer does not mean they don't have dignity. If people are afraid, it does not mean they lack courage. If people are enduring difficult circumstances, it doesn't mean they don't have hope. That pictures don't undermine dignity um, necessarily. I didn't think the picture of Alan Kurdi uh, undermined his dignity. I think it, it, it caused a great deal of sympathy for the young boy and for his family and for all of the immigrants. And if it had been a picture that was not dignified in some way, that didn't recognize the sacrifice that had been made, then the picture wouldn't have had effect. Well, James uh, Natwe, thank you very much. Uh, it's been a real pleasure to talk to you. And take care. You're welcome. <laughs> thank you very much.